into Christmas and it's the first day of Advent, can we uh, start practicing for our singing on the steps? Uh, let's sing your come on your day. ceremony done and that basically is only for men you know, women are all excluded from that and it's only for Brahmin and one or two other castes and then it's to seek salvation uh, and then when I went to the temples in this country I found that as a 15 year old spotty faced child teenager who really didn't care about the faith I was given lots of respect by people who were not Brahmins but who were much older than me uh, and I couldn't understand or accept that you know, God made distinctions 
just by way of a wall. So I rejected Hinduism, I became an atheist pretty much, and then at university in sunny Scotland, in Aberdeen in fact, uh, with the Christian Union, I came to faith in Christ. And the key verse to me is Galatians 3.28 where it says, but there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, we are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so actually that in Christ, it doesn't matter where we're from, we can actually be one in Him. Now, when I naively became a Christian, not naively, when I, when I became a Christian, I naively thought, oh, in the church we'll all be one and we'll be wonderful together. But then suddenly I discovered that it was a rude shock to find out, sadly, that there is prejudice and racism in the church as well. Uh, and that's, if you like, is, is key. For, so when people say things about racial justice, oh, that's what the world does, and we really shouldn't get involved in all those kind of things. I always say, actually, it's gospel. It's in Christ, through the cross, we are reconciled to one another, and we need to be one. And if we want to preach a gospel of reconciliation out there, then we need to be practicing it in here. Because otherwise, you know, they'll call us hypocrites. So that, that's that's my, my faith journey of why racial justice is so important to me, and why I encourage it within the churches that we need to do this. Now, in our vision statement, in the, in the beginning it says, we are a spirit-empowered community of churches growing in holiness and unity, working to be at ease with our diversity, and aiming to reach London for Christ. And one of the things that we're saying to churches is that in the run-up to the 150th uh, anniversary in 2015, we're encouraging churches to think about reaching, because it's 150, we're saying, try and reach 15 new people for Christ by November 2015. Some people will say, oh, that's a tall order. Some people will say, oh, your faith is too small. But try and see if you can see, reach 15 new people for Christ. Um, one of the things is working to be at ease with our diversity. Well, how well are we doing in London within the Baptist churches? Well, I look out among you, and you're very, very diverse. So I think, you know, you'll have all the foods under the sun. Do you? All the foods under the sun. Majority of the foods under the sun. So we're incredibly diverse. And hopefully, in terms of our culture, in terms of our worship, etc., we'll be growing in diversity. And I think that's, that's really good. In London, we have churches now from Romania, from Latin America, from Burma, uh, and of course, there are significant African and Caribbean congregations, uh, and they're growing and they're vital and they're great. Just, what's the sad point in it? There is one sad point in it. I don't know if any of you saw an article in the Sunday Times last week. I don't know if any of you yet Sunday Times. There was a particular article called Polite White Flight as Culture Divides Us. Polite White Flight as Culture Divides Us. And what it was saying is, that the white British community are moving out of London. As it becomes more and more diverse, they're leaving us. So I'm sure in your luxury flats, it's not just people from abroad who are living there. There, there are many white British people living there. Would that, would that be true? There are some white British people living yeah. in, your, in your flats around? They're all foreign. They're all, uh, they're all foreign. Uh, they're basically Arabs. Oh, and, right. uh, Arabs and Iranian and Oh, there's some Eastern European. Okay. But mainly foreign. Okay. But are there, are there any white British people in your community? Uh, uh, me? No. No, we're. We're. Oh, but. Yeah. But I mean, uh, yeah, there are some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but what about in your, in your other. other... What, what were we talking about? Sorry, what was the question? Are there any other white British people other than yourselves in this community? There must be a few. Within people. the church? No, no, not within the church, outside. Oh, oh uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. In your luxury flats, is it? No. No, not in your luxury flats? Uh, no. Okay. Um, they're, they're mainly foreign. They're all foreign. <laughs> they're all foreign. Um, we have Jewish, uh, Muslim, and Eastern European. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, yeah, so it's very, very diverse in the luxury flats. <laughs> and Americans, and Americans. And Americans. Well, I would say try and reach all. You know, for Christ, and so that. Well, it's, it's amazing. There's actually um, there's 13 flats, right. so that if, if you could reach them all, yeah. right, then you would be two off the goal. So there you go. So, and so we are, the, uh, yes, we're two off the goal. Two off the we goal. are trying to we, we are trying to reach them on a daily basis. Excellent. But we, we, we can go a little bit more, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. 
So that, that, that's one of the challenges that we are facing as an association. That we are now a black majority association, but we would like to be reflective also of the white British community that we don't want them to leave, we want them to stay. But sadly, in some of our churches, that's what is happening. Uh, so I was even in a, in a church uh, uh, sharing on this issue last Sunday evening, uh, and uh, they had a, 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 a white pastor for many years, and then their associate, who was a black pastor, had become the lead, uh, and the lady was saying, sadly, some of our white folks have now left us. Uh, and that's, that's a sad thing, and, and that's something we need to work on. We need to address it. Um, there is no hope of us being genuinely multicultural and intercultural if people find it difficult to stay there and they leave. Uh, so there's, there is this rich diversity, but there's more work to be done. Um, and maybe the passage that I'm going to read to you and share with you from this morning will give us some pointers on, on what we can do together. Let me read to you. It's from Matthew 1, verses 1 to 6. And these are the words. It says, A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amidabad, Amidabad the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, uh, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And you may see, oh, what on earth are you going to preach from that? Because it's just a list of names. Um... And is it going to be a boring sermon? It might be a boring sermon. You can tell me afterwards what it was. Um, but actually, in this genealogy of Christ, we find that God is there among unexpected people who are mentioned here. And uh, what I want to share about is actually finding God in unexpected places. There's a book by Philip Yancey of that title. I haven't read it all, but it's quite interesting. But finding God in unexpected places. And I'd like to share about three of the women who are mentioned here, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth, and one man, Uriah, Uriah the Hittite. Um, these three women lack power, they lack privilege, they lack social standing, and Uriah was a man and in David's army, so he'd have had some power, but he would have been, as someone has mentioned, if you like, a foreigner, he went to Israel. And why are these three people included, or these four people included in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you look at commentators, they'll give you various reasons. One of the reasons they say is, it's the immoral standingness, standing and sinfulness of Tamar and Rahab. We'll look at their stories in a minute uh, and say what, and ask why may they be, why are they considered immoral in what they did? Uh, and uh, what Matthew is trying to show is that God is incredibly gracious to sinners by including them. But if you actually read on, you know, David and Solomon were also immoral. And they were great sinners, but they're there as well. So why should these women, if you like, be signaled out? Second is the inclusion of, uh, a reason is second is the inclusion of foreigners. And by including foreigners, it means that the, the covenant of God is opening out to the whole world. But, you know... God, throughout the Old Testament, has always had a heart for everyone. It's not something that's particular. So, you know, even though he called Israel, Israel was to be a light for the whole nation, you know, kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Third, they say there's the scandalous situation of Tamar and Rahab, and that kind of prefigures the scandalous situation that Mary will have in her life. But I wonder if that's also maybe clutching at straws. And the final thing is, you know, here's the inclusion of women. And again, it's a sign of God's inclusive heart. If you read again in the Old Testament, you have, you know, the great prophetess and leader like Deborah and Esther, who was there, you know, a woman at the right time. So, so why? Um, 